This is the Truth Frequency Radio Network. T-R-T-F-R. Truth Frequency Radio. I would remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. America's evil genius, Travis Cook, back with you once again for another week of eye-gouging, crotch-kicking, no-holds-barred political discussion right here on TFRLive.com, Truth Frequency Radio, and the iHeart Radio app. Glad you are with us on this Tuesday afternoon, wherever you may be tuning in from, be it around the world or be it from anywhere across this the greatest nation to ever exist in the history of the world, the United States of America, as we come to you as always from the intellectual dungeon on the outskirts of war-torn St. Louis, Missouri. Glad you are well and glad you are with us today. Do you remember Eddie Haskell? Eddie Haskell. Do you remember him? If you are roughly my age or older, my mid-40s, then you surely remember Eddie Haskell. If you're younger than me, you may not remember Eddie Haskell. But if you're in your mid-40s, you're in your 50s, you're in your 60s, certainly if you're in your 70s, you know exactly who Eddie Haskell was. Eddie Haskell was a character on the old TV show, Leave it to Beaver. And while it's shocking to me to know that there are young people out there who have never seen Leave it to Beaver, I know it's true, as shocking as it is. So let me give you just a brief explanation here. Leave it to Beaver, if you've never seen it, was one of the first truly successful American sitcoms. And it was about kind of a prototypical American family, June and Ward Cleaver, and their two uh, their two sons, Wally and Beaver. And if you've ever if you've ever heard people in modern times refer to the show, they always kind of make fun of the fact that the father on the show, Ward Cleaver, was always wearing a suit and tie, even if he was sitting in his easy chair reading the paper. Or they'd always make fun of the fact that June Cleaver, would she would vacuum the house or be doing housework or cooking a meal she would be in a very nice dress and dressed up in nice pearls and everything and people today kind of chuckle at that but it was not it was not presented as ironic back at the time it wasn't presented as humorous it wasn't a joke that's just how they presented themselves in the show that was what you did on tv back in those days but in any event eddie haskell was a character on leave it to beaver and he was uh, a friend of the older brother, uh, the older brother uh, Wally Cleaver, in which school then. And the deal with Eddie Haskell was, and the reason Eddie Haskell so mem- memorable to those of us who saw him, was that he was a completely disingenuous character. Completely disingenuous. So the deal with Eddie Haskell was like when he would come by. To visit Wally Cleaver. He'd come by the the Cleaver household and he'd ring the doorbell and Mrs. Cleaver would open the door. You you could count on Wally to say something like, oh, good afternoon, Mrs. Cleaver. That's a very lovely necklace you have on today. That kind of thing. Just really laying it on thick. Whenever the adults were around, uh, uh, Eddie Haskell would go above and beyond to... uh, make himself appear and make himself sound like the most polite, the most nice, the most studious young man in the world. And then when the uh, adults would get out of earshot and he was alone with Wally and the Beaver, that's when the real Eddie Haskell would come out. That's when he'd be like, hey, hey, let's go down to the park and and and, and slash some tires on some cars today. <laughs> you know, it was kind of a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde thing, right? And so then, you know, like, let's say him and, and Wally are going to the park and Mrs. Cleaver sees him. Oh, where are you two fellas going? You could 
see Eddie say something like, Oh, Mrs. Cleaver, we're going to the park because it's a nice, quiet place to study. Even though you know they're going down there to slash tires or whatever other mischief they're going to get into, right? That was Eddie Haskell. Completely disingenuous, a guy that would say whatever you wanted to hear to your face just so that he could get past you and get access to do whatever he actually wanted to do. Completely disingenuous. And I thought of Eddie Haskell this week as I continued to examine the Senate race going on here in Missouri. Specifically, I thought of Eddie Haskell in uh, reference to our current sitting Senator, Claire McCaskill. Now, we talked a little bit about the Missouri Senate race last week, and I know I take a certain degree of risk on this national and international program by discussing Missouri politics, but the reason I'm discussing this race with you is that for those of you listening to me outside of the Show Me State, I suspect a lot of the things we're seeing here in terms of a campaign, in terms of what's going on, mirror to a great degree what may be happening in the Senate and House races in your own part of the country. So that's why I'm wanting to use this as a little bit of a case study. And I bring the race up again this week because as the week has gone on since the last time you and I talked, Claire McCaskill has really ramped up the campaign ads. She's really ramped up the rhetoric of trying to make herself sound like just the regular small town Missouri grandmother who's not that different from us, and she's really not like all those mean Democrats that you see on TV all the time. You'll recall last week when we talked about this, I told you about the Claire McCaskill campaign strategy. And it's not just a campaign strategy for this year. This is the campaign strategy Claire McCaskill has engaged in for every office she's ever run for in this state. Senate, governor, auditor, whatever. She's always done this. Her... Modus operandi is to put out ads and go to town halls and so forth and portray herself as having the same values as a typical rural Missourian and that she's she's a centrist who will reach across the aisle and she just wants what's best for everybody and she really is in touch with Missouri values. So even if you're a, a rural Missouri voter and, and you have a lot of doubts about what the Democrats talk about on the national level, well, you can rest assured that Claire McCaskill's not really like that. She's one of us, and she's one of the good Democrats, and by golly, you can trust her. And that's kind of been the Claire McCaskill strategy from day one, and in previous elections, let's be honest about it, it's worked. She is, after all, a sitting senator. Well, she's doing it again. Recently, this week, she had a, a new campaign ad come out where she is hanging out with a bunch of Border Patrol agents and she's in a helicopter flying around the border and she's talking about how strong she supposedly is on border security. Now, that's no small thing in Missouri because border security and illegal immigration is a very key uh, issue for a lot of rural Missouri voters. So, here again, Claire McCaskill's trying to play that card. But you see, Claire McCaskill, her whole career has been like Eddie Haskell. Treating the voters of Missouri like June Cleaver and telling us what we want to hear so that she can get past us and go to Washington where the real Claire McCaskill comes out. So what I wanted to do this week, and I wanted to do it in depth, and I wanted to do it point by point, because it's one thing for me to say, well, Claire McCaskill's two-faced, and Claire McCaskill says one thing here and does something else when she goes to Washington. It's one thing to say that. But Claire McCaskill actually has a record. She's been in Washington. She's been in politics long enough. She has a record. So what I wanted to do this week, particularly for my Missouri voters, but even for those of you outside of Missouri who may be seeing a similar thing happening in your state, I wanted to examine the actual Claire McCaskill record versus what she says she is versus where the average Missouri voter is and bring to light who the real Claire McCaskill is. Now, let's start here. Since her most recent campaign ad showed her 
in a helicopter flying over the border and examining what the border patrol agents were doing and really tried to make her look like she's a a real uh, real tough gal on border security. Let's talk about the border and illegal immigration in sanctuary cities and what Claire McCaskill's actual record is on that. Well, for one thing, Claire McCaskill voted yes to continue federal funds for sanctuary cities. It was a, a situation where there was a bill out there to create a reserve fund that, to ensure that federal assistance does not go to sanctuary cities that ignore the immigration laws of the United States, to create safe havens for illegal aliens, potential terrorists. And uh, the vote in question is a vote to table that amendment. Uh, voting yes would would kill the amendment, but she uh, she voted yes. She killed that amendment. She can do all the commercials she wants to, or she's flying over the border. But when it came time to actually put a foot down and prevent federal money from going to sanctuary cities, she didn't do that. She voted to keep the money flowing. Earlier this year. Claire McCaskill spoke to some members of the Missouri Farm Bureau, the subject of President Trump's wall, border wall came up. And she said that the wall is far down the list of needs voiced by border security personnel. That coming from KTTS.com, which is a radio station in uh, Springfield, Missouri. They reported that on August the 13th. Now think about something for a second. In this little ad that she put out last week, she had Border Patrol agents in this ad saying that, well, we support President Trump and we support Claire McCaskill because they're both strong on the border. And yet she just said to Missouri, the Missouri Farm Bureau that the wall is far down the list of needs voiced by border security personnel. So she's not on board with the wall. Now, I told you last week that President Trump won this state going away to the point that he won 111 out of 115 counties and to the point that in 71 counties, he now holds the record for highest percentage of a vote by any presidential candidate ever. And what got him that huge turnout, that huge win? It was his message, centered around the wall. Claire, I don't know if you don't get this or not, but the wall is not a euphemism. The wall is not figurative. No, the wall is literally. We want the wall. That's what Missourians voted for, was for the wall. But you're going to Missouri and challenge. You're going to Washington and challenging it. Oh, she even had some kind words for Kamala Harris out of California regarding immigration. She said that Harris, and this is her quote here, Harris has been a leader in this effort to make sure we have an immigration policy that is true to the heritage of this country and not the misguided ideas of this president, end quote. You mean the ideas of this president that won your state by about 20 points and set records in 71 of the counties that are going to be voting for you. You just had that ad where a border patrol agent said he's for Trump and for McCaskill, but you just said that you preferred an immigration leader that went away other than that wanted to move away from these so-called misguided ideas of our president. Claire, we voted for this president and we voted for him because of his immigration policies. Now, you're going to make an ad out here where you try to make yourself sound like you're as tough on immigration and unforgiving on immigration as he is, but there's your record. You aren't. You're saying one thing to us to our face, and the second our back is turned, or the second you get to Washington, the second you're at the, at the cocktail parties and whatever else, you couldn't care less about our views on immigration out here in Missouri. Let's talk about Claire McCaskill on taxes, shall we? She's oh so quick to talk about wanting to help the middle class families here in Missouri, working families in Missouri. And she's so quick to tell the story of her own upbringing, which was 
very much middle class, very much small town, and that's true. I'm not, I'm not taking that away from her. That was very much her background. But in discussing all this help she wants to give the middle class, the problem is she voted against the GOP tax cuts. She voted against them. I'm looking at my paycheck stub every week. I'm paying less taxes than I were than I was before the tax cuts went into effect. And Claire McCaskill voted against that. She did. Now, later on, when someone brought this up, she kind of tried to play both sides of the debate after the fact. She said, and I quote, So there are parts of it, speaking of the tax bill, so there are parts of it that I would look at, but I would never touch the parts that are actually delivering savings to the majority of people in my state. That's a quote that she gave to the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. So let me get this straight. While, while it's hard for me to take this on face value, Claire, let's, uh, for devil's advocate, for discussion purposes, let, let's, assume you're, you're, let's assume you're not lying here. You're fine with parts of the tax bill, but you didn't like the parts where rich folks are, are getting a tax break too. So you would have kept parts of it, but yet you voted against it. Well, that tells me something. If, 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 if your top priority was to help the middle class or your top priority was for the parts of that tax bill that helped the middle class that cut our taxes, then you should have voted for it. But the thing is, you didn't vote for it, which tells me one thing. It tells me that you place a higher priority on not giving tax cuts to the wealthy than you do on giving tax cuts to the middle class. Instead, the president killed two birds with one stone. He cut taxes on the so-called wealthy. He cut taxes on the middle class. That's helped us not only in the short term of smaller tax bills for ourselves, but it's also helped us in terms of a much better job market and people investing in business now. But I guess you don't like that because that was the part of the that was the part of his tax plan that you just couldn't abide by, and so you voted no on it. The only thing you can interpret out of that was that refusing tax cuts to the so-called wealthy was more important to her than tax relief for the middle class. Fortunately, we got both in spite of her no vote. Let's talk about Claire McCaskill on guns. And this is a big one for a predominantly rural state like Missouri. Now, Claire McCaskill, if you ever see her at a town hall or if you ever hear her get the question of guns brought up to her, you you will be regaled with tales of her childhood in which whatever they had for dinner was pretty much whatever daddy shot that day. And again, I'm not doubting it. If you are of a certain age in this state and you lived in a rural area, that was your reality. I'm not saying I've lived through that, but my parents in their, in their youth, they certainly did, and they're close to Claire McCaskill's age, and certainly grandparents did that. You know, So that very much was a thing, that whatever meat you had for dinner, if you had any, was whatever daddy shot that day. If it was a rabbit or a deer or a squirrel or whatever it was, that's what you're going to have. And so Claire McCaskill is always so quick to bring those stories up in order to let people think that she's very much in favor of gun rights because, after all, if it weren't for guns, she wouldn't have been able to eat growing up and neither would have a lot of other people. So she would have you believe that she's very much pro-gun, unlike a lot of Democrats. But then you actually look at her record. Claire McCaskill voted yes on banning magazines of over 10 rounds. Now, I want you to stop and think about that for a second. People want to talk about AR-15s and so-called assault rifles and whatever else, but when we're talking about banning magazines of over 10 rounds, that affects a whole hell of a lot more than just so-called assault rifles. Do you realize that the vast majority of handguns out there today have magazines with over 10 rounds in them. Commonplace firearms such as the Glock 19 or something that I carry myself, the uh, the Springfield XD, which has 12 rounds in it, they have more than 10 rounds. Duty weapons that police officers have always have more than 10 rounds are closer to 15 to 17, depending on, 
on what they have. And, of course, we, uh, we the people, have access to those arms too, thank God. And Claire McCaskill wanted to ban those. She wanted to ban the very, the very magazines, the very type of handguns that not only do police officers use to protect themselves, but also that regular Americans routinely use to protect themselves. Be it a handgun we have on our, on our nightstand when we go to sleep at night or a handgun that we carry to protect ourselves. She wanted to limit that. Claire McCaskill, despite all of her talk about guns and hunting, was nevertheless rated F by the NRA. In addition, not once, but twice, Claire McCaskill voted no on a National Concealed Carry Reciprocity Act, 2009 and 2013. She voted no twice. And yet there's many people in her her very own state that when they leave in the morning, if you're like me, if you're on the eastern side of the state, and you leave in the morning, you have your gun uh, strapped to you, and you think, wait a second, am I going to go over to Illinois today? If there's a chance I'm going to go over to Illinois today, I can't really bring my gun. we got to deal with that. Claire McCaskill could have done something about it, but she voted no, twice. Also in 2013, Claire McCaskill voted yes on banning a lot of the popular sporting rifles, such as the AR-15. There's a bill called A711, A-711 that she voted yes on, on that type of ban, which is asinine to me because while Claire McCaskill talked about guns in, in the terms of hunting, and of course they are useful for that, the main reason we have guns, the main reason we have a Second Amendment is personal safety and security from the government and from our fellow man. People use guns for self-protection in this state, and she knows that. It's not a surprise to her. And yes, there's an awful lot of us, myself included, who use AR-15s for home defense. And she wants to ban that from us. She, she literally wants to directly impact the tools that I have to defend my home and my loved ones. So don't let her talk you into thinking that she's reasonable on guns. Her record, what she's actually voted on, proves the opposite. And uh, what about cultural issues for Claire McCaskill? Or shall I call her Claire Eddie Haskell McCaskill? Go back to the uh, Ferguson controversy when we had thugs running amok in Ferguson setting buildings on fire and causing riots. What was her response? Her response was, and I quote, this kind of response by the police has become the problem instead of the solution. I obviously respect law enforcement's work to provide public safety, but my constituents are allowed to have peaceful protests, and the police need to respect that right and protect that right. She was quoted in the Washington Times as saying that. Yeah, she blamed law enforcement when thugs who were memorializing a criminal named Michael Brown were running all over Ferguson, causing trouble, setting buildings on fire, shooting people, and she said it was the cops' fault. Do you really think that's in line with the Missouri values? Missourians, especially once you get outside the major cities, the two major cities of St. Louis and Kansas City, Missourians believe in law and order. We support our police. We don't criticize them when they're in a practically impossible situation when they are in what has become a literal war zone, we don't criticize their tactics. We don't criticize their actions. But you did. Speaking of cultural issues, back on May 25th of this year, the Planned Parenthood Action Fund gave McCaskill a 100% rating. Now, do you honestly think that abortion is something that is thought very highly of in rural Missouri. Oh, hell no, it's not. And you'll say whatever you want to say to the folks in rural Missouri, I know, but once you get to Washington, you clearly did enough to impress Planned Parenthood. That's not reflective of our values, Claire. Also, in 2013, McCaskill announced her support for same-sex marriage. 
She did it on Tumblr right above her frittata recipe. And yet, every time same-sex marriage has been polled in rural Missouri, every time we've had any kind of vote on it, it's been summarily rejected and by large margins. But yet you supported it. Now, Claire, I know you grew up in small-town Missouri. I know you had the experience of living in rural Missouri. I know culturally you have a background similar to us. But the problem is you went to Washington and you forgot who you were. And you got corrupted. Why or how it happened, I don't know. And I don't really care. But you're at a point where you've got a number of years of a record that you can look at. And that when you're sitting here telling us in Missouri that you're just like us and you share our values and you have the same background we do and it all sounds good, It all sounds nice, but then all we have to do is look at your record and say, wait, that may be what she says she is, but that's not who she really is. A person's actions mean a hell of a lot more than their words. Claire, we've seen your actions for a lot of years. You're not one of us. And you folks who are voting around the country in other races... I think a lot of your candidates are trying to do just the same thing. Doug Jones did the same thing in this Senate race in Alabama, trying to make himself sound like one of you when he's not. We'll be back with more right after this on TFRLive.com. <laughs> 